Ladies and gentlemen, stick around. We've got Ideas by Elliot. Hey, folks, you're listening to Ideas by Elliot. And we're here with Ideas by Elliot. Podcast, podcast, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> This is the Ideas by Elliot podcast, sponsored by Camera Corner Studios, Yikes Salon, Trisha Nell Law, and Release Wire. I'm Elliot Christensen, and normally I spend my time working with clients on their internet projects. Websites, marketing, email, all the stuff they need to get their business found online. This is my chance to take a break and talk in depth with the most interesting people I know. There are no rules, there's no censor. There are no do-overs. It's raw, unscripted, and never edited. This is episode number 24 with renowned internet security expert and my third favorite brother, Eric Christensen. Today we talk about encryption, the FBI, and BAM. Here is Eric's composition of My Favorite Song Part 1. Christensen is a software engineer over at Schneider National. We're going to talk about some network security. You were given a little background about what your network security background is. Uh, I want people to understand when you talk about these things, there's a little bit of authority. Sure. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, my background is uh, I used to work as a network engineer at uh, Green Bay Net. Uh, and I dealt uh, with a fair number of network security issues there. Um, and since then, I've spent um, a few years doing uh, software engineering at Schneider. Um, and sort of in between and alongside that, I've done um, some mobile application development uh, for iOS um, and for Android. Um, so I, I have a, a fair understanding of what goes into making an iOS app and, uh, you know, some of the um, the restrictions of the operating system and some of the security measures that Apple's uh, put in place. Um, so I guess uh, I, I feel like I can speak with a, a slightly above average um, understanding. Of in it. tech circles, this has been talked to death, but I think most of the people that listen to what I put out don't listen to that stuff. Uh, they might listen to, you know, the nightly news or read the Wall Street Journal or something like that and get sort of an overview. But could you kind of give a recap in your okay, eyes? Okay, so specifically what, the Apple what phone happened situation that's happening that right situation? now. Okay, so, uh, okay, so Apple has um, cooperated with the FBI before in opening, uh, in um, unlocking some phones. Um and uh, in the case of the San Bernardino killer, there was an iPhone that the FBI wanted access to. Um, they feel that there's some uh, additional data that's going to help them uh, with their investigation. I, I, apparently, they must have some other persons of interest or they're fishing for people of interest. Uh, so they approached Apple and said, can you unlock this phone? Uh, if the FBI tried, uh, they only have uh, 10 tries to enter the security code. Um, or the phone could be wiped clean and they would never have access to that data. Uh, what they've asked is for Apple to bypass that security um, or give them a way to bypass that, that um, restriction so that they can try any number of passwords with, without having the phone um, you know, delete all the contents. Uh, Apple has uh, said that that's not possible in the new version of the operating system without writing additional software. And their argument is that if they were to provide this to the FBI, it's kind of like giving a master key to every bank vault in the, in the country. Um, you know, the, the FBI would be the ability to um, 
open every iPhone, or at least the technology would exist um, to open every iPhone, uh, which wouldn't be good for honest iPhone users. So is that true? Well, it's, uh, I'd say it's partially true. Um, it's, uh, the Apple side is mostly true. Um, the, uh, the FBI's claim that this would only be used for one device is um, kind of a ludicrous proposition. The, they're, uh, they're saying, hey, Apple, open this one phone for us. Um, this is the only one we care about. But uh, I guess, uh, you know, there's, there's iPhones all around, all around the country that are in the hands of law enforcement. Uh, but, you know, that they haven't touched because they're, they're afraid of the contents being wiped by this. Um, so it's, it's very um, naive to assume, to believe this, that Apple is going to write this, uh, this program for the FBI. It's going to be used on one phone and then they're going to throw it out. Uh, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, mesh with reality. Um, now, is it is it true that um, it's going to uh, go, you know, get into malicious hands? Well, that that really depends. Um, I mean, the fact that the software exists makes it hard to argue that it's 100% foolproof. Um, you know, what, whatever security measures they put in place around it. Uh, so I, I have, it, it, you know, I, but at that point, Apple's kind of saying we don't trust our own employees. Um, so I'm not sure how I feel about that, but you know, not, not everybody that works at a company is ethical. Somebody could make a copy of it, uh, even if Apple went into it with all the, with every intention of the world of deleting every copy of this this software. Um, the fact that they uh, the fact that it exists means that copies are going to get made, and you know, there's going to be um, flaws in their plan at some point. So. I think it, it's it's fair to say that it's mostly true on both sides. Have you seen the? There's a Facebook thing floating around showing the, a physical key that's in use by law enforcement in New York City. You're talking about the one where you plug a USB cable into the iPhone and it. Uh, no, 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 it no, no, you no, no, no. You're th too technical. I'm talking about a physical key that can be used in elevators and emergency situations by law enforcement to get, get to get to places and it's a physical key. So somebody got the master key and is making copies and selling them for five dollars on you know on eBay or you know if eBay even shuts them down like they'll sell them somewhere else, right? No, I hadn't heard that, but it doesn't doesn't really surprise me. It's a good analog, even though it's not exactly the same thing. I, I feel like when uh from the law enforcement standpoint, I feel like uh it's a little bit misleading to say that there's this master key that can be used to unlock someone's phone and it'll never get into the wrong hands. Well, I'm sure they said that about this particular master key and it's now infinitely redistributable. Uh, and then I read, uh, I didn't actually see the keys, but I, I read an article saying that the TSA uh, has a master key of some kind that can be utilized and they they put a picture a picture of it ended up online somehow and so off that photograph somebody did a 3d printing model of it and so now you can download the key the idea that these things can't get out uh, we're talking about these are physical things that have even been either digitized or just replicated and sold online if something's digital to begin with it's infinitely copyable and there's and there's also no way to know if it's been copied so that's the fear I have. Not the fact that a bad guy can get it. It's this false sense of security that we're going to think no bad guy did get it. It's even worse than that. Um, you know, with, even with the case of a physical key, okay, let, let's say everybody in America got a copy of that key. Well, there's still other ways to protect those, those assets. You know, if you want to protect that elevator or that, you know, that room or whatever these keys are able to open, well, you could still do so. I mean, you could still, you could change the locks. Um, you could, I mean, e even if you didn't know that, you know, you could still have additional layers of security on top of it that most people with their phones aren't going to be able to. You can't, you're not going to have a security camera on your phone at all times, but you could reasonably have a security camera on a door. Um, you couldn't, you, you 
nobody's going to have an armed guard following them around protecting their phone, but you could have an armed guard for a building if the, you know, if, if it's valuable enough. Um, you know, so there's, there's security, you know, the, the analog break, the, the analogy breaks down a little bit when you start comparing it to physical security of, um, you know, of buildings and other infrastructure. Um, you know, whereas with this, if somebody swipes your phone, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it's really hard to track that down. Somebody breaks into a building, at least they're going to leave a trail, you know. Theoretically, but if they have a key, then they're not, they're not going to leave a trail either. The other side of the argument is people that are super pro law enforcement. I hate painting the picture that I'm anti-law enforcement. Sometimes I think we have maybe too many laws and maybe they are enforced in the wrong manner, but I would like there to be safety in our society and I would like there to be people that are charged with doing that, with keeping some... What do you say to people who are claiming that we need to do everything and anything possible? to stop the terrorists or wh whatever bad guy we're talking about this week? Well, I say they already addressed that minority report. I mean, what we're essentially talking about here are thought crimes. Um, with, uh, you know, if you, if you plan out a terrorist attack in your brain, you know, you, you don't communicate this to anybody, is that illegal? If you have documents... but your brain is the only thing that is off limits. Your fingerprint, your DNA, your hair, if you write any notes or you draw any maps, all of that stuff is uh, discoverable by law enforcement at any time. Yeah, and I, and I, have, I have issues with that too. Um, and here's why. If you, let's say, uh, I mean, in a perfect world, that's fine. In a perfect world, law enforcement are completely ethical and no piece of evidence is gonna be misunderstood um, or taken out of context. But let's say you and I had some sort of weird inside joke and we talked about blowing up a building. And uh, you know, we, we pass little sticky notes back and forth to each other with little, little plans about blowing up a building, even though we knew it was a joke. Well, now that's discoverable. Someone else happens upon that. It looks really bad for us, but we've committed no crime. We've never, we didn't blow up a building. We never intended to blow up a building. Um, you know, but, but now that's discoverable evidence. I, I understand why it's discoverable. I understand why it paint, helps paint a picture, but I don't, I also don't believe that it always paints a 100% accurate picture because those things are by definition taken out of context. So in the case of a phone, you have, you have, you have information that, okay, first of all, the, the reason that I, I compare it to a brain and, you know, we, we say, um, you know, fingers are off, your fingerprints are discoverable and uh, sticky notes are discoverable and all that is um, those are ways that we interact with the environment. When you have a phone and, you know, you, you make little notes, you take pictures, whatever, you could make the argument that you could, you're engaging in some sort of conspiracy to commit a crime if you're actually sending that information to somebody. But if it just exists within your phone, then that's not really hurting anybody. And that, that's not really a place that law enforcement needs to go. You know, if they have a legitimate belief that you're, you're conspiring to commit a, a crime, there's already ways that they can tap communications. But in that communication part is the strong part of that, of my argument, because, uh, you know, they, they're not, if they record a conversation between you and somebody else, that's conspiracy to commit a crime, right? If, if you're talking, if you're discussing the details of carrying out some terrorist attack or whatever, um, if you're thinking about it, that's not a crime. If you have a phone and you have notes to yourself, that's not a crime. If you transmit those to somebody with the intent to coordinate some sort of plot, now we now that is a crime. So there's a difference between what exists within somebody's brain or what exists within somebody's phone and the communication of, of those things. So that's kind of that's kind of my argument. 
Do you think that this is a legal thing that needs to be discussed by lawyers, or do you think it's a technology thing that needs to be discussed by technologists, or do you think this is an everybody thing that the masses should weigh in on and trump up the whole situation? Well, actually, I think there's a there's a big legal hurdle that uh, that stops the, the, any of those other arguments right in their tracks. You and I don't really have um, much to say about this, um, unless there becomes a law that forces companies like Apple to comply. Right now, what we're essentially doing is putting an undue burden on Apple by forcing them to write software that doesn't exist, forcing them to spend resources, uh, and forcing them to now um, take extra precautions to make sure this is extra secure and it doesn't get into the wrong hands. Uh, that's, that's too big of a burden to put on somebody. The technology doesn't exist, so it's not even a matter of, you know, hey, Apple, hand over this technology that we know you have. We're saying invent something new that undermines your credibility in the marketplace. Well, that that doesn't fly. That that's they they don't even have any legal grounds to do that. <laughs> so, we can get anyone we want in the debate, but really, when it comes down to um, Apple's willingness to comply with the FBI, it's just that it's their willingness or lack of willingness to comply with the FBI. They've said they're not willing to. Case closed. That's an interesting aspect of the whole discussion too, because they're a private company, and they're being forced through a writ of some kind. I don't even know what the heck that actually means anymore, uh, but it's some 200-year-old rule that basically says, we don't have a law for this, but we want you to do it anyway. They said no to that, and rightfully so, because it's not a law that's on the books. They're not required to do it, and they are being asked to do these additional things. But I think that that's something that the general population doesn't really understand. So do you have a way of clearing that up a little bit where why can't I just get somebody's iPhone and see what's on it? Oh, boy. Um, why can't you technically or why can't you legally? Technically. I, I think the legal thing is a separate thing, like the should the FBI be able to look. But let's say the FBI had the phone in their hands, and so what is keeping the FBI from technically being able to do it themselves? Well, I, okay, I'm going to give two answers to that. Um, the first answer is that the device is encrypted, um, that the uh, they can't just copy the values um, off without having some, without without having a way to decrypt it, um, to you know, to actually, and all that means is the data is scrambled in a certain way that you need a key to unscramble it. Uh, FBI, the FBI could very easily extract a bunch of scrambled zeros and ones uh, from this device and try to reassemble it. Um, they lack the uh, the actual ability to put those back together in some sort of meaningful order where they're going to be able to get data out of it. Okay, so that's my first answer is that technically they can't do it, but technically they probably can. Uh, they have access to the device. They could get this in the hands of an FBI encryption expert. They could brute force this thing and they could spend the next 10 years plugging away at it. And eventually, you know, some method of cracking that encryption will probably exist. Uh, all they have to do is copy the data off. You threw out a, a few technical terms there. So can you give a 10,000-foot view of what encryption is? Well, uh, okay, it's it, encryption. Uh, okay, 10,000-foot view, It's uh, you could say it's just encoding it. Um, it's like using a... Um, <sighs> Gosh, uh, how do you how do you explain encryption <laughs> easily? Uh, it, it's just a way of scrambling the data. Where if you have some sort of key, like some sort of password, um, and and a method, you know, like a like, and it's been used since since the Roman Empire. Um, you know, you, you, to communicate messages, you you take uh, you take a sentence. Um, a sentence consists of a finite number of letters. You scramble them in a certain way. 
now it's encoded. Um, you have to know, you know, may, maybe all your A's become T's and all your um, B's become X's, um, you know, but you don't know what they, you don't know what they are. And that's, a, that's an overly simplistic way of looking at it. But um, every, how about if I take a crack at it and you tell me if or how I'm wrong. Okay. I always think about encryption as just being math. So I have this message. I have this data. It could be a photo. It could be a sound recording. It could be a Microsoft Word document. It could be an email. That's translatable, just like you said, into zeros and ones. But let's just say numbers. And there are some math equations that are complicated, but basically it sums up to the processing power to do to do the uh like if you think about in terms of multiplication or division it's a lot easier to multiply the numbers than to do the reverse and divide it these particular mathematical functions use extremely long numbers usually we're talking about in terms of like 4096 bit long keys which are really huge 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 numbers the ability to cycle through all 4,096 bits of potential keys, like you said, would, could, that could take 10 years. So it would be impractical to try all the keys. And so, and there's no way to have a computer deduce it the other way. You can't just, without having them try every key, there's no shortcuts. Without having a, a table infinitely long, they don't know the answer to, if 2 times 3 equals 6, they don't know the answer to, they don't know what's on the other side. All they have is 6, and they don't, they don't have the 3, so they can't get to the 2. They, don't have, they need a table to decipher that stuff. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair characterization of it. It is complicated, but yet it's sort of not complicated. It's math. There's, to my knowledge the NSA and no other government agency has really come up with any shortcuts for the types of encryption that we use in computers. Uh, not the newer ones, that's, that's correct. Correct. Yeah, that brings up another aspect of this. So we have, we have a precedent for the kind of thing we're talking about, a backdoor. In the early days of the internet, when Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator were the ways that people used the Internet. So back in 1995, 1994, those browsers had encryption in them, but they could only be 40-bit encryption. I was talking about 4,096-bit encryption. Well, this is, uh, and these are different types of encryption, but basically the encryption keys were an order of magnitude too small. And so 40 bits is something that computers could easily crack. It's not that the, the higher, the, bit, the larger encryption keys were not usable or not invented yet. It was U.S. law that kept us from creating those programs that used higher encryption keys. It was against the law to have better encryption. Basically, now, if you try to use those, 40-bit encryption is still usable through the internet in certain places, and those things are super hackable. So let's say your bank needs to work with old web browsers. It might only support, it might, you might be able to have it support 40-bit encryption. So even if your browser uses more, you can trick it, and there's, there's, there's just ways for the bad guys to get in. Oh, absolutely, yeah. That's what's really scary is we have law enforcement who, you know, they're biased. They, they, they're going to say, they're not going to look at it balanced. They're going to say, this is what we can crack. And this is, these are the tools we need to catch the bad guys. So they're coming at it from one side and they're, they're going to be biased. And we have to recognize that. Those of us on the other side are like, we need to have the strongest possible encryption at all costs because the bad guys don't follow our laws anyway. You know, and I, I always hate that argument because it's like the, you know, gun control people use that and it's used for drug policy too. Like the bad guys are still going to take drugs. The bad guys are still going to have guns. That doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't have some laws against some of those things. 
I think the average person can understand the use and consequences of certain types of drugs. The average person does not understand encryption. They don't understand the implications and what that actually means. You know, what we're talking about is if this sort of thing happens, where we allow encryption to be compromised in any way, uh, I feel like we could be potentially opening us up to all encryption is useless. And I think that's the real fear. Or am I overstating it? Well, I think uh, no matter what encryption we have today, um, it's going to be crackable in a few years anyway. You know, so it, it, what, what, we're, what we're dealing with is really finite uh, in, its, in its usefulness, and we're going to have to come up with uh, stronger and stronger encryption methods. Because lawmakers are so slow and seldom agree, do you think that they'll be able to keep pace with changes in technology? See, this is one of those cases where I don't even understand why they have to. I mean, so what if people encode their data? It's their data. I mean, if, if you want to secure your credit card information, you should be allowed to do that. And you should be allowed to take, you, you should be allowed to, you know, have a, you know, have whatever level of encryption you want. If it's, uh, you know, if it's your safe, if it's your key to your safe deposit box, you can store that in a fireproof safe in the middle of Fort Knox for all anyone else should care. It's your stuff. So, and if you, if you want to protect it, the, the, you know, the, this isn't uh, this isn't a gun. This isn't this isn't a gun that's lying out on your front porch where your toddler can get at it. This isn't uh, a bag of cocaine. This is protection, and it's only used for protection. So, you can't you can't even make an argument that this is offensive. Like, you know, oh, I'm going to break into your your computer by encrypting something. You can't do that. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> You're making you're drawing a distinction between the on phone data and uh, inter device communication. Yes, yeah. I, well, I do I do make a distinction there, but I also I really question the utility of it in general. I mean, to me, it sounds like lazy police work that's led them down this path. I can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so, so in years past, um, can, can I get a little, little crass with this? Okay, so uh, it's, well, it's, it's your show. I don't want to turn off your viewers, but okay. So in years past, I, I can completely understand why the, the, the fact that the FBI approached Apple for this is totally understandable. It's completely understandable. Um, they asked them for a favor and Apple's done it before. They've done it with, uh, I, I can't remember how many other, 10 or 20 other iPhones before, but they were older versions of the phone. Um, the FBI, in their eyes, it was the same thing that they were asking them to do. Can you unlock this phone for us? Apple says, uh, says uh, yeah, we can do that but in, in previous cases. And this, and this time, Apple says no. Well, to the FBI, that probably feels a little bit arbitrary. Um, but, you know, so, so then they try to get, they try to force them to. And the analogy I draw there is uh, Justin and Becky, I'm just throwing some random names out there, happily married couple. Um, Justin says on a Friday night, hey, Becky, how, how about you and I have sex? And she says, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Sure. The next week, hey, Becky, that was pretty great last week. How about we do it again? And uh, Becky says, sure, that sounds great. The next week, she says, oh, you know, I could take it or leave it, but okay, when, when he asks. Okay, so they repeat this process 10 times, 20 times, doesn't matter. Well, then uh, Justin asks Becky on some random Friday night, says, hey, Becky, how, how about some sex? And she says, no, no, I don't think so. And he just says, but you've done it before. Well, so then... Uh, you know, she, she refuses. He walks away and goes gets a judge and asks for a court order to force her to have sex with him. And that's what the FBI is doing to Apple right now. So do you think it would have been easier if Apple would have never cooperated? 
it, they they would have a they would have had an easier time with the FBI. Um, I think that they there would be less public discussion about it. But I I don't think that they it would be easier for them legally. I think it would be the same. I mean, the fact that they've done it before, you know, that they volunteered to do to help the FBI before, is not a contract to help in the future. Um, so I don't think there's any anything that makes it, you know, more or less um, easy from a legal standpoint. But yeah, if they had never done it before, uh, which you know maybe in retrospect they shouldn't have done it before, um, they uh, they'd probably have an easier time with the FBI and with um, the uninformed public. Apple's a U.S. company. Google's a U.S. company. Right now, the two major worldwide phone operating systems are U.S. operating systems. And one of the two major manufacturers of phones is a U.S. company. Do you think that it's... What, what do you think the world is going to... How the world is going to reply to all this? Oh, well... First of all, I, I, I guess I don't know what the current state is of uh, encryption export laws, because um, this might not actually matter in some other countries. Right now, uh, like the U.S. had uh, the the chief uh, uh, encryption export laws before. That was the whole Netscape Internet Explorer 40-bit thing. Basically, encryption is relatively borderless right i mean if uh, you could take out uh pockets like north korea right i'm sure they have some crazy law in normal countries it's you can basically use whatever you have to use sure i don't think any of us would be surprised if if uh, the chinese government had restrictions uh over there that they inflicted upon at least the chinese manufacturers um, so far, we haven't heard of Apple fessing up to anything. Well, nor nor. Well, we might hear it. I think we actually would hear that. I think they would. I think Apple would try to fight it, like they're fighting it in the U.S. Um, my understanding is that China didn't didn't try to do anything like this. They wanted to see how the U.S. would react first. So they're, uh, you know, theoretically they're waiting very optimistically on this. There was a weird story about that uh, in the, I think it was in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Um, and I understand they're two different papers. I just get them mixed up. <laughs> um, they, they had an article talking about China uh, was very interested in the results of this. And then they mysteriously deleted that part of the article out. So that, as an aside, that's just a little weird. Conspiracy theories abound on that, I'm sure. But that that makes a certain amount of sense, right? Like they might uh, they might not want to upset the U.S. They might not want to upset the world's opinion of China as a growing economy by by them being at the forefront of this. They would much rather that the FBI screws it up. Well, sure, sure. Um, I, and and to your um, original question, how is this going to play out internationally? It really depends on which side wins. Um, I mean, there's there's governments out there that would love to have backdoors uh, to be able to spy on their uh, on theirs and other countries, um, you know, citizens. Um, especially, I would imagine in Europe, although you wouldn't hear of it. Um, but uh, you know, foreign travelers, who doesn't? What what country doesn't want to make some sort of case that there's a good national security interest in spying on foreign travelers? Um, you know, or, or their own people. I mean, that we certainly try making that case here often enough. Uh, so if the FBI wins and, and we're able to force Apple to do that, there's going to be some very happy government agents. But also I think the, the consequence of that is going to be that it's going to put foreign um, uh, operating system manufacturers at an unfair competitive advantage. And it's probably going to shift a... Um, our phones are, you know, manufactured, and um, it's going to really create some openings in the marketplace, especially when it comes to um, corporate 
uh, phone contract. So, uh, assuming that the FBI wins, uh, which I, I don't know that it's a foregone conclusion either way, which is what makes this such an interesting thing to to think about and to talk about. Obama gave an opinion on the matter over the weekend or on Friday, maybe where he was saying, don't be so quick to uh, be absolutist in the position. I'm paraphrasing. He didn't, I don't, I don't remember exactly what words he used, but, but basically he's saying, you know, look, we already have uh, search warrants. We already have wiretapping and whether you agree or not with those things, we do have those things already. Why can't we come to some sort of a compromise on this? What do you think a compromise would look like? And is there such a thing as a compromise in something like this? Well, I could, I could say what a compromise, what, what they would have in mind for a compromise. Um, they would say it's a, a situation where, you know, Apple retains the code and they unlock the devices on a case by case basis. That way Apple's able to secure whatever um, software they come up with for this purpose. Uh, that that's going to be the government's uh, version of a compromise. Um, you know that this this will never be that whatever whatever program they come up with, whatever device that they come up with to unlock these, uh, however that works, is not going to be in the hands of the FBI. That that would be the compromise that I see. Now, is there really a compromise? No, for the reasons that we talked about before. Once that technology exists, it will be copied. There's going to be some Apple employee on his last day that's going to make copies of it or somebody on his first day. It doesn't matter. Do you think that uh, there is a possibility of Apple or Google or somebody coming up with a, uh, maybe it would have to be a hardware-based solution, I don't know, but some way that is just simply not reversible? Didn't we try that in the early 90s? Wasn't there a, an encryption uh, chip that they were trying to get in computers and that backfired miserably because it was easily bypassable by some basement hacker? I think that's a different thing, though, because the um, that was for publicly available content. So you would still need to enter your password, but um, the way encryption works is there's there's sort of two keys on it, right? So there's your password that you put in, and then there's the the like the other side of the equation and so that's the part that apple uses to encrypt the communication a combination of your password and the master key do you think that there's a way that they can keep that i don't know uh you know lock it up better so that there's just no way to extract it i you know i'm not sure exactly what they're talking about doing with a custom operating system or custom firmware to to extract it or to extract the data but do you think that there's a, a way to keep that from even being a possibility not i i, I can, not, nothing is coming to mind i don't i don't i don't see that playing out in any way that uh, at some point somebody has to have physical access to the phone somebody has to Yeah, I know. I, I don't. I don't see that happening. I don't. I don't, I don't see that. I'm going to paraphrase how I kind of see that, and you tell me where I might be seeing it wrong. So right now they have what's called firmware, and that's something that's updatable by downloading a new version. When you get updates on your your iPhone, uh, you're overwriting some of that stuff. What I'm saying is, I think that there could be a way that they could take that the encryption layer of what they're of of that operating system and put that out of reach of even being updated hard coded into a chip that would have to be removed and if you remove it then the encryption stops like you can't encrypt you can't unencrypt it without that chip and that chip is hardware can't be changed and nobody can have access to it so that even if i brought the phone to apple they'd be like well you can try a bunch of passwords but uh, after 10, it's going to blow up and then you're just done and there's nothing we can do about it. Do you think that they can't do that? It seems to me that that should be a possibility. I think they choose not to do it now because 
uh, they'd rather be able to update it. Uh, yeah, is it? It's possible. I mean, you know, the the thing I always go back to is that this is all physical components at some point. Um, you know, and, and if somebody has physical access to the device, they could take it apart. They could, um, you know, they they could replace physical portions of this device. Um, you know, unless you had some situation, some you know, a situation where if the battery ever died and the uh, the power was completely removed from the device, it would automatically wipe itself clean. You know, um, I don't know. I mean, I, maybe I'm not very imaginative, but I don't I don't see a situation where it's never possible. Um, you know, where where your your security is just that good on on a little mobile device that you know you can fit in your pocket. Um, I, now, now, can will it be very difficult? Will it be out of the reach of the average person? Yes, I believe that we can get there very easily. I don't, I don't think that we can get beyond the realm of possibility, though. We've never, we've never done it before. We have no reason to suspect that we will. We've been talking about iPhone security in particular. Uh, the same methodology and the same uh, ideas would apply to Android or Microsoft or BlackBerry phones. Shifting gears just a little bit, what do you think, the, uh, assuming that the FBI gets their way, what do you think would be the ramifications for other forms of communication that are encrypted? So, for instance, right now we're, we're uh, having this conversation over Google Hangouts. Google might already be sharing this conversation with the NSA and the FBI. I don't really know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, do I think uh, it's going to lead to backdoors and other software? Absolutely. There's legal precedent then, recent legal precedent. And that, that's the key piece that the FBI is lacking right now. It, that's why they're going back to a you know, 1700s law, because they don't have anything more recent to lean on. If they win this case, yeah, it's gonna, there's going to be a, a ton of other um, technologies and communication methods that they're going to want backdoors to. And for the same reason, it's going to be the same exact reason. They're going to say, you know, wow, there's, there's someone committed a crime. We think there might be some other, um, you know, piece of information that might make us implicate, that might lead us to implicate somebody else. We want to find it. And, oh, by the way, we can make you now because we won this, cat, this case with Apple. And that's the thing that gets me. Like, you know, the, the San Bernardino killer is dead. And they're, they're talking about needing this for an investigation. Well, I say, I, I, I think as soon as, they, the, sorry, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but as soon as they bring someone in and they have enough other evidence, I'm going to feel a little bit more um, sympathetic to their case that they need access to this phone if they can explain why they need access to this phone. Right now, it just looks like they're fishing. You know, unless they have somebody else in custody that they are charging with a crime and they need this for evidence. Do you think they really screwed up by uh, having a dead guy's phone? <laughs> I think it would have made a lot more sense if they had a living, uh, you know, in custody suspect and they had probable cause to go into this phone. I mean, I guess you could say they have probable cause in this case, but to make a case against a dead guy, we're already pretty sure he he was punished let me take the the crazy conspiracy theory standpoint do you think it's possible that the fbi said you know what everybody's got a phone we can't check everybody's phone go through this hassle go to apple go to google go to you know whoever samsung deal with all these phones wouldn't it be better for us if they were just off limits completely and we could have that as our excuse? Do I think someone there floated that idea? Is that what you're asking? Do you think that it's possible that they knew that this was never going to fly and they're like, well, that's good. Then we have an excuse. It, it could be. It could be just to, or to test the boundaries. Um, I really don't. I don't get it. I don't. I don't understand why they didn't pick a better case. Oh, I. Well, I don't think they knew. 
I don't think they made this. I, I don't think they brought this phone in uh, to to make to take some sort of stand. I think they did what they did before, and Apple helped them before. They didn't realize that there was a that there was a technical difference between this and the older versions of the iPhone. And I thought they thought it was going to be an easy uh, an easy thing that Apple was just going to say, "Oh yeah, that's easy. Let's do it." I don't think they intended to make a big case out of this. I think Apple has to make a big case out of it. <laughs> okay. In your eyes, and and maybe uh, giving a, a simplified explanation for it, what is the difference between this phone and older phones? Well, older phones, it was uh, it, it was possible to bypass that restriction. Um, you know, giving the FBI access to either unlocking the phone. I, I can't remember if they unlocked the phones outright or if they um, just disabled that um, the after 10 tries, your phone is wiped clean uh, functionality. Uh, but that's the big difference is that they've, uh, in the newer version of the operating system, they eliminated their ability to do that. Um, you know, they, they, before they kind of had that backdoor uh, available to them, and now they've they've made this new version much more secure, which is uh, you know much better for the for the consumers. Um, you know, and and it's stopped devices like I, I mentioned it before because I thought this is where you're going with the key argument with that that uh, USB device where you can plug a, a USB cable into an old iPhone uh, with this little black box, uh, press a button, and it'll disable the uh, you know it'll it'll unlock the phone for you. Um, and so that was, but that was a, I don't know if you want to call it a feature. It was a limitation of the security model of the old phones, um, that Apple said, no, we, we need to fix that. That's, that's a whole, that's a problem, uh, for our customers. We, nobody wants that. Nobody wants anybody that can buy this thing on, you know, I don't, I, I don't know where you can get this device exactly. I didn't, I didn't want one, <laughs> but but yeah, any, anyone that has this device or the know-how to build this device could unlock an old iPhone. And Apple didn't want that, so they fixed it. It's much more secure now, and the FBI has a problem with that. You know what I think is amazing about this whole thing? And then uh, I, I just want to leave it to any last thoughts you have on it. I'm amazed in the last decade, and I know 10 years is a long time, and I know there's the whole axiom of, People overestimate how much things change in five years and underestimate how much changes in 10. 10 years ago, we were talking about Windows XP and how bad the security was. And everyone knew that and hated it. They didn't want viruses. They didn't want to get hacked. And now we're talking about potentially saying we would like as a society to have limitations on how secure our devices can be. I'm amazed that people that lived through that era of never knowing if your computer was being used to hack other computers or to steal your own credit card data, I'm amazed that anyone would feel differently. I understand terrorism is bad and gun violence is scary and they don't want their children to take drugs and all of these criminal types of things that they want society to be protected against and insulated on. the switch to be so jarring to me. And I know that it was 10 years in the making. Even then, you know, we were in a post 9-11 world with Windows XP. It was so bad. And, and the Mac was slightly better. But uh, even then, the, the Mac was, you know, just slightly better from a security standpoint back then. Everybody hated that. Everybody didn't, nobody wanted it. We were buying extra software, antivirus programs <laughs> to try to improve our security. And now we're talking about potentially limiting how much security our devices can have. Well, I, I think it, it underscores um, just how uh, fickle uh, consumers can be that, that anyone, that any consumer would uh, e even think that what the FBI is doing is uh, is welcome, uh, and it also, you know, is a testament to our short-term memory as a society. We, do, we don't really, 
we don't really remember our mistakes. We don't really remember the problems that we used to deal with. We uh, we look at uh, the past as this uh, in, in sort of an idealized fashion. People remember their Windows XP machines. I don't think very many people remember the frustrations with them. Uh, I've talked to people recently that had that loved Windows ME. They couldn't put a finger on why. I think they just you know remember this earlier time and are uh, nostalgic for it. Um, but if you stuck them back in those in, in those years with the issues with those operating systems, it, it would take them less than a day to come to their senses. So that's my last thoughts on that. So now we'll switch <laughs> gears to something hopefully a little more fun. I don't know. Tell me about this group that you're starting. Uh, when we're recording this, it's March 14th and on March 15th, you have some kind of meeting coming up. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the, because we couldn't come up with a better name that included any um, reference to what the group is about, uh, it's called BAM. Uh, it's, it stands for Big Data, Advanced Analytics, and Machine Learning. Uh, and BAM was a lot easier to say than BADAML. The, uh, the group is a, it's a data science group. We're going to meet uh, every other month, uh, at least to start off with. Uh, it kind of comes from, um, I, I was... Uh, down in Madison with a coworker uh, listening to a talk at uh, a group down there called Big Data Madison. And we, we were talking about how we really wished that, you know, something was filling that space in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, and that space is just a, a meetup group, um, a, a professional community group where, uh, where data scientists can get together. We can see some speakers, uh, bring in some experts to talk about different uh, things going on in the data science community or the data science world. Um, and I, sh I suppose I should tell what I should explain what data science means because probably not a lot of people um, listening will will know what that means. <laughs> address who you think the the chief audience is, what that actually means, some of those those terms you threw out there. and why a lay person might want to attend maybe not every every session but uh might want to attend some of them well uh yeah, certainly that we're going to have some topics that are mo most of these topics that we have the speakers that we bring in at least for the next year are going to be at sort of an introductory to maybe a moderate skill level uh we're not going to be bringing in anyone to talk about advanced topics because frankly in in northeast wisconsin we don't have a lot of people doing advanced machine learning or advanced um, you know big data applications uh, so what what these um, what these words mean machine right. learning one thing that might be of uh, that might help you to explain what machine learning is there was the the Japanese game go that whole scenario where there was a machine learning algorithm that beat the world champion at go over the past week or two weeks, whatever it was. Yeah, I saw, I saw an art, I, I just saw the headline. Of that. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a perfect example. Um, you know, machine learning is artificial intelligence, right? It's, uh, it's teaching machines to do things that they weren't explicitly programmed to do. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a machine learning to drive. Uh, Self-driving cars are an example that I think everyone's heard enough of lately. Um, learning to play a game, um, you know, learning uh, learning which ads are relevant on Amazon, um, so that it knows what you care. It learns what you care about, and these are all this is all done through machine learning. Um, and sometimes that ties in with uh, what we call big data, just huge volumes of data. Sometimes not. Sometimes it doesn't take a real lot to have a machine kind of learn on its own. Um, so that's the, uh, the machine learning part is, uh, is my, um, personal area of interest. Uh, but there's also, um, in, in the data scientists, there's a lot more than just, um, artificial intelligence. There's, uh, which is, you know, that, that part of it is a lot of math. Um, it's a lot of statistics, um, you know, but, uh, the other, the other sides are, um, you know, that we want to, but there's also a lot of societal lot implications of society. and, and um, philosophy, like, right? Philosophy, right? Around uh, machine learning? Yeah. So 
Oh, sure. Sure. Um, I mean, there, there's, I, I would say primarily from people that don't understand it. Um, you know, you, you certainly see in science fiction, you know, um, like iRobot where the robots, you know, get uh, ticked off and rise up against uh, their creators and stuff like that, um, which is certainly possible, but um, not with, we're, we're nowhere near that level. Um, but yeah, there, it's, and the, the other side of it that you're probably getting at is, um, you know, sort of like the, the right to privacy and uh, people, uh, you know, taking advantage of sort of the, the, the breadcrumb, breadcrumb trail that you leave online as you, uh, you know, do Google searches and you, you know, shop on Amazon. Uh, they're tracking all that and they're learning from your behavior. And yeah, there are some ethical implications there. And that's stuff that'll be uh, revisited again and again in the future. And that's uh, that's pro that's probably going to be a subject for one of our upcoming talks. <laughs> I don't want to give away too much. You're going to be meeting tomorrow, March fifteenth, Tuesday, and where where does this take place, and who should show up? Okay, so um, the other side. I, I want to first of all, the, the other side is because uh, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's a machine learning club. Um, there's also what's called yeah. There, there's also what's called big data. Uh, which it just means either high volumes of data or um, the high velocity of data, you know, many th thousands or millions of transactions a second, you know, you think about stock, you know, following the stock market or following bank transactions, things like that. Um, and what, what do you do with that data? Um, you know, how, how can you, how can you even look at those, uh, the, at all that data at once? Um, so there's parallel computing aspects of this, where you're using many, many machines to look at the data instead of just trying to do it with one. Um, you know, so th there's there's other aspects of it, and how do you visualize that? There's there's tools for that too. So who should come? Um, anyone with uh, any sort of uh, computer science interest or. Uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of business use for this. Uh, for anyone that's interested in cloud computing, um, anyone that is uh, just you know interested in um, either you know, let me let me tell you who's coming to start with. Um, we have uh, some academic interests, so there's certainly um, some members of the UWGB computer science uh, department are going to be there. Some of the professors, and I think some of the students, um, as well as some people from. Uh, you know, the transportation industry and, uh, and a couple of others, um, you know, that where, uh, you know, where people are just starting to dabble in this, I would say. Um, in Northeast Wisconsin doesn't have any, you know, big, any, any large analytics companies. Uh, so nobody's really doing this, um, you know, in any major way. Um, Schneider certainly, um, you know, spent the last year getting their foot wet uh, and so have a few other companies. So, People that are in uh, people that are in IT, people that are interested in uh, in a any of this from an academic standpoint, for sure, are welcome to come. So tomorrow night. Yeah, so tomorrow's our kickoff meeting. Um, tomorrow at uh, at Titletown Tap Room, which is at. Uh, it's uh, right across from the Tidal Town uh, Rail Depot, the old building. Uh, they have their brand new tap room. Uh, we're going to be meeting there just for a kickoff meeting. So we don't have any speakers planned, but we're going to, um, we have like about 25 of us going tomorrow uh, that have already, um, you know, signed, registered to go. Uh, but anyone that wants to is certainly welcome to just show up. Uh, we have a, uh, Let's see, tomorrow we're just, we're gonna meet for a couple hours. We're gonna have, uh, just have some beers, uh, talk about the direction of the group. Um, a company called MAPR has uh, agreed to uh, buy the beers. So free beer if you wanna come. Um, and we're gonna uh, just kind of pull people's interests, find out, um, you know, what their level of interest is, what their level of skill is, if anyone's willing to uh, perhaps talk about a project their company is doing in the future or an academic project. Um, but, uh, you know, primarily it's just to kind of, you know, meet and greet, um, talk about, you know, what, what the future holds for our group. And then after that, we're going to meet every other month. Uh, it'll be the third Tuesday of every other month at the same location. Uh, Title Town has been awesome to us. Um, they've agreed to, you know, uh, work with us on that schedule and, uh, and grow, you know, uh, 
they've uh, given us a real nice uh, room upstairs from the uh, from the tap room to use. And in return, we're going to bring some people in and uh, and drink some of their beer. <laughs> people should RSCP through Meetup. Yeah, it's uh, um, it's just meetup.com. I think it's slash BAM data science. Um, but it's I'm logging in here. Just uh, give me a moment. I'll get the address. I, I'm pretty sure it's just BAM data science. Uh, so I think we can probably wrap up. Uh, do you have any uh, music tracks that, that uh, you can share with me to play? That I can share with you? Um, well, how do you want them? Oh, so that I'm in. <laughs> oh wow. Um, yeah, I, I do actually. Okay, um, awesome. I have that I recorded a, a couple, uh, about five years ago. Uh, it's got me playing uh, keyboard, me playing harmonica. Um, it's got digital drums, which I wasn't, uh, all too thrilled about, but yeah, it's got a, got a couple pieces in there. It's all, I just, uh, recorded it one track at a time. I'll, I can send that over. So do they have titles? Um, yeah, I would, I just have the, oh, no, no, I, I recorded them. I just mean one instrument at a time. No, 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 um, I, I, no, I mean the, the, the songs, do they have titles? Oh yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, this one was just called favorite song. Favorite song, and do you have do you have more than one? No, I just I just have the one. Okay, so I mean, I'll I, so I I'll, I'll, open, I'll I'll open with favorite song part one, and then I'll close out with favorite song part two. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's BAM Data Science. So meet, www.meetup.com slash BAM, B-A-M, Data Science. Uh, it's the URL right to our group. I want to make sure that anybody listening is on board with me in thinking that it's awesome that you were on. I know that you've been highly requested in the past to be a part of this. If anybody has any tech questions that or things that would be of interest on a, on a global nature, like, you know, not like, why is my CD-ROM door stuck? You know, not that kind of stuff, but more uh, things of general interest or things that would be good to discuss and, you know, hammer through like this, uh, the Apple iPhone FBI thing. I think that they should uh, shoot me a tweet. You can get, you can find me on Twitter at Elliot and you're on Twitter also. Yes. Yes. I'm at Orkin. So you can tweet both of us or one of us and uh, we can try to uh, address those questions some other time. I'm going to just close out with my favorite song part two, right? forget to run over to iTunes and Stitcher and give a rating and review of the show. It helps other people find us. Cheers.